Well, uh, welcome to uh, another Microgiants meeting. Um, we have John Mills here with us. We may have another join or two into the panel today. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, perception as it has to do with advertising. And uh, so let me pull up a couple of slides here and I'll, I'll, sh I'll share the screen and we'll get going here. Okay, make sure you can see that, John. Does it look good? Yes, it looks good. All right, great. So I realized that this is going to be, uh, as I started on this this uh, little uh, program, I, ha I had some old stuff, but uh, it wasn't quite as germane, and it wasn't as thorough as I think we wanted to get into. So this will be part one. I don't know how many parts we'll have. kind of depends on where we go uh and the conversation and so forth but i think the least be i know for sure two and probably three uh just on on basically on content how do you create content what does it mean and you know i mean the more i thought about it the, the more complicated it gets and i've done this a little bit but you know in in places where you have to squeeze it into 20 minutes or 40 minutes so you can only touch the surface in most of those cases so okay so here we go um basically just wanted to bring you back through and and, and for every, everybody who may not be familiar with micro giants and <clears throat> give them this sort of background uh if this is interesting and you want more information there there'll be some links you know down down below the message here and um basically the content can either be message the, the message can be uh, which is synonymous with content can be images and words, videos, of course, all combinations there therein. And so um, we have worked our way around the customers' competition, competencies, targeting, positioning. We jumped across to communicate, which is really media. That was our last program uh, uh, last year, and now we're starting with content because it is a bigger subject. And so um, we're, we're we're taking it just a little bit in um, out of order, but I think this will make more sense because we'll be able to cover content a little more. And actually, all of these different points, content is probably the hardest to achieve um, from a organic, from a creative standpoint. That's just it's just a little bit tougher to do. Um, so let's move on here. So when we plan the, the, the campaign, again, this is background. Now the campaign has been defined. We've got a sequence of promotional activities that really are designed specifically to be able to um, match the marketing statement, be delivered to the target market. And we're going to do that by communicating a specific message um, to, that, to that target. The first thing we do is we determine what that message would be based on the marketing positioning statement for each target market. And we'll, we'll discuss this a little more. You might have one campaign, two, three, four different targets, same basic campaign, different, different audience. Uh, and then of course, the second is the media is determined. As I just talked about, we kind of reverse that this time. So, um, uh, but normally that's the way you would do that. So the target then it, you create a customer profile. I mentioned this just briefly because this is where you define what the customer, the, the buyer, the purchaser, who that is, what they're like. And that generally comes in demographic form and psychographic form. Psychographics um, is sort of another word for behavioral profile. Uh, the behavioral profile has something to do with the personality of, of that person. And so then further breaking down, you've got commercial uh, or business to business and B to C or business to, to, to customer. So again, each one of those is a little bit different approach. Uh, advertising to a customer is quite different. Most business customers, as we've spoke of briefly, <clears throat> briefly over the over the the uh, the different meetings, um, typically you're dealing with a buyer with a business. So that's somebody who may be a professional. 
Yes, it's possible that somebody might be in the office ordering office supplies, yet that person likely does it all the time. They become more and more and more aware uh, as they do it, and they understand costs and, um, and sizes as they do it as well, so they know more and more about it. They're a little more sophisticated. Good morning in progress. Hi. Hello, Edgar. And so um, we, we've we got... Uh, uh, so, so you've got the customer profile in uh, kind of sorted out, really organized, determine exactly who they are, and then you build a, in the campaign, which has to have a purpose. What are you going to do? And the goals, what do you hope to achieve? And what are the results going to be? Um, now, in order to really do a message, the whole point here is we're trying to communicate. Uh, you know, and what is that old thing? You know, what we have here is a failure to communicate. That message is not getting across if you fail to communicate. And <clears throat> so that really means we're trying to convey some information. Um, it also kind of means to reveal clearly or to manifest something. So it may not be words, it may be an understanding. But then there's also this interesting kind of definition, which is to spread to others or to transmit like a disease um, or, you know, might be spam or some sort of a viral message. So there's sort of a downside to this communication thing. And what we're trying to do is number one and number two without getting into number three. Uh, the whole word spam came up. Uh, as, a, as a new word, I suppose it was around 2000 or so, um, which really meant uh, don't give me something that I don't want and don't and you're giving or you're giving me too much of it. It doesn't matter to me. Um, there's no meaning to me. And that's kind of where that came from. Um, it gives spam a bad name. The English love spam. It kept them alive during World War II. They do not have this negative connotation about what spam is. But we we have kind of learned in much of the world that it, it really is just too much of something that you don't want. We don't want to do that. Now there's another aspect of communication and and. Um, uh, one of my partners years ago was a communication major, and we used to have sort of this argument, and he enlightened me a little bit. So you got two-way communication or one-way communication. In other words, if you are if you are having a conversation with someone, then you can get some feedback. You know that they're, they're engaged when you have a two-way two communication. That could be a dialogue. It could be on email. It could be in chat somewhere you know there's some feedback so you can tell what's going on voice to voice salesperson to buyer terrific been around for five thousand years you know you kind of tell based on what someone looks like their expressions i mean and um what they say um you know what what are they really meaning versus what, what they're saying so i think we all recognize that these can be two different things well this is true with all all media so i wanted to kind of you know you, you in the top of your mind you kind of go okay what is it we're trying to achieve here then you know it's like well can you communicate so that they can see it and um you know, here we got a situation where somebody buys that teeny weeny weeny um, billboard, and not only is it so far from the road, but it's on a lonely road where there's only about three cars a week. So, you know, it's sort of like it doesn't do you any good to put the communication where it can't be seen. Of course, that's media, and we're, you know, we're kind of sliding off of that just a little bit, but um then finally we have to communicate in a language that's understandable now we've had a lot of conversations um edgar is an expert in communicating in spanish to his spanish-speaking customers and that's not just what we mean i mean it is what we mean but it's not only what we mean we're talking about a whole visual dialogue audio smells a whole dialogue that communicates to the receiver to the prospect in this case and so it it ends up it ends up being a little bit like a total experience so when we say communicating in a language that's understandable we're talking about 
really, really knowing who that target audience is. What do you say? How do you say it? It can be lethal if you do it wrong. For instance, uh, with, the, with uh, one client, um, a dairy, we thought that everybody, because everybody constantly talks about um, bottles being recyclable, reusable, and how wonderful that is, we naturally assumed that everybody was a little bit more um, green, maybe, than, say, the average person. And while we didn't go overboard, we didn't say we're environmentalists or anything like that, we did talk about the, the, the real facts on the ground, you know, sustainability with the farm, uh, the recycling capability, which was very much one of the reasons that that glass was was selected many, many, I mean, decades ago. But that was an assumption that was wrong. When we were able to look deeply into who these people were by utilizing some of the, these, the, life, the lifestyle demographics or, and demographics, but lifestyle psychographics, those particular um, cohorts, in other words, grouped together by behavior, we discovered that we had a small, a little bit smaller group of browns compared to greens. What's a brown? Well, a, a green is what you might expect. Someone who really stands behind recycling, environmental stuff, perhaps um, might be a little bit more disposed to listen to the arguments about global warming. Brown, on the other hand, is don't believe it, don't want to do it, think the whole thing's stupid. Now, the question there is, how do you communicate with one group versus the other group? when demographically they're very similar in, in most ways, most of their cohort behavior is the same, except in this one particular thing, the greens go out of their way to recycle. And so to them, recycled uh, glass bottles is extremely important. To the Browns, it's like, nah, I don't really care. You know, it doesn't matter to me they're buying the product, they're buying the taste, they're buying other things. So in most ways, they would be similar. They would have different behaviors. One might buy a, uh, an electric car, which you know, is perceived to be cleaner than a gasoline car, um, at least by the greens. Browns, maybe not so much. Uh, they'll do more recycling, et cetera. But for the most part, they may have everything else may be very similar. But Pushing too hard on the green side of things could alienate the browns, or the browns could alienate the greens. You need to know who you're talking to. Um, so let's talk a little bit about perception. Um, this is interesting. So um, if you guys you guys uh, give me be feel free to give me feedback here. So. Um, this is the question here is what is it and different people see things a different way you may not uh, it may it may not be exactly what you think it is so um john or edgar what do you guys see here or both of you what do you guys see here when you take a look at that image well i see three pac-men okay it's, it's it's very based on where I've come from. There are three Pac-Man men going at something. It may be each other, right? But of course, I could see a triangle as well. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay, great. So so uh, I don't I don't know. It looks like uh, it looks like we lost Edgar there. Um, but Ed's coming on for it. So I'm I'm right here right now. I just have to change over to my iPad. Oh, okay. Um, so just like, tell us, just tell us what you see there. Or can you see the screen, Edgar? Yeah, I do see kind of like the the triangle in the middle, right? Did you uh, did you see the, that first? Uh, that, that's the first thing I saw, and then I saw the triangles. I mean, the uh, circles in the back, kind of like in okay. the foreground. Okay, great. So here we've got an example of two two different people seeing two different things. Uh, so now, tell me what you think about this. Who see who sees what here? I always see the younger lady. I know there's an older lady in there somewhere. Ah, you've been trained on this one. 
I have seen that before. Yeah. Okay. And so you see, you see the old woman, but you yeah, can't I see, see the old woman. Every time I, I first look at it, I see the old woman. And then I, then I know there's a younger lady there. <laughs> okay. I still don't see the older lady. I know she's in there. I, I t oh, there, I finally saw her. You did. Okay. So yeah, it took me a while, but so I always see the younger lady. Here's the right, right. If you can see my mouse, here's the chin of the old woman. Here's yeah. the mouth with her, her lips tightly sealed. Here's the nose. Yeah, it takes me a while, but I always see the younger lady, but no matter what, my mind only wants to go. I don't see lady. the younger lady. I don't see the older lady. I'm looking really hard. Well, do you see? Okay, you see, here's the chin. Yeah. There's the mouth. This is this is the scarf over her head. And then here's the nose. There's an eye, and there's an eye. Boy. <laughs> Boy. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see it. I yeah, no. <laughs> well, and I'll tell you, if you're really good at this, you can go back and forth. Huh. Yeah, now I can go back and forth after yeah. I, yeah. I had to identify the older lady a lot. And you're, you're a graphic artist. And so, you know, it's, it doesn't surprise me that you can train yourself to go and see it, see it a couple of ways. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting that we have different perceptions. So like in this particular one, which is, you know, a famous Escher, one it's like okay different people see different things which one are you going to sell some people you know if i describe um think about a waterfall and a grist mill with a water wheel um you know you might look at that but then on the other hand if i said something like you know water that is flowing uphill you might look at that a little differently now, probably you've all seen this. No. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So take a take a good look here. Follow the arrow. Here's the water. Here it's flowing down, flowing down, flowing down. Whoa, what the heck? It's on the top. Wow. How did that happen? So what we have is a perpetual motion machine because the water is flowing uphill, even though it looks like it's flowing downhill. This is my first time I've seen this one, but it does it does throw you off a little bit. Yeah, a lot actually. So Escher spent much of his life doing things like this. He's got some others that are just phenomenal. If it's it kind of is a mind blower. He's got some where it's, the, the ones I really like are the ones that are steps where, you know, you see some guy going up steps and then you look carefully and there's somebody underneath him and he's going upside down, down the steps. And then somebody else is going sideways up, you know, and each one of them looks perfectly you know, in relationship to the steps, they each of the people look just fine. They're really walking in every direction. It's really, it's really incredible. And so this is really the, the, the point here is to really say what we think we're communicating isn't always what is being communicated. Now, here's another one. We just got a couple of this. So the, the, how many people well, what is what do you see first? I, I always the see the lady first. You see the man and the lady, okay? Yeah. yeah. Here's the man. I always, I always see. I always see the guitar. The the younger folks first. Oh, have you seen ones. You've seen this one before. Yeah, I have. I'm obsessed okay. with these things. So. <laughs> so. That's number two. Can any of you see a third image? Yeah, I see the lady in the doorway. I, I start off by seeing the old people immediately. Then I immediately go to the, the guy playing the guitar. And then I get drawn to the lady in the doorway. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then I, then I see another woman on the other side holding, which is a little bit softer, holding yeah. a, uh, something on her head. Right. Yeah. And that's the last one. <laughs> And so, there's something in the middle, but I'm not sure what's in the middle. Ah, okay. Well, so what, what you're you're describing components of the same image. Correct. So, so we've to collectively we've seen two images. We've seen the man and the woman. Then we've seen the guitar player and the opposite lady. This is the ear over here, or yeah. a woman coming out of a door. But part of this picture, 
but if you carefully look, you'll see that there is a golden goblet right here. Here's a chalice. Yes, it's a chalice. Mm. Yeah, I see it. So, so there are actually three separate images in this one photo that I've been able to find. <laughs> I don't know, maybe there's even more. So then we have um, unintended things, sometimes subliminal, sometimes just faux pas. So, you know, you look at this and you go, three in one people in Louisiana will die from heart disease right next to these croissant sandwiches, two for three dollars. It's like, oh, that's, that's, a problem. <laughs> that's pretty funny, you know, so you've got two different people paying for this uh, CBS sign. And uh, both of them are looking at each other at the, the rep going, you didn't really put these next to each other, did you? But, you know, of course it did happen. Or maybe this one right here where you've got three accused of getting <laughs> rape. <laughs> well, these three here that are pictured are actually the reporters. <laughs> those, those are the nighttime people on Local 15. I mean, it's like, who was thinking of this when they put this up? You know what's that, that's so funny <laughs> no what is what is going on well then you've got this airplane you know that is is going down the escalator this wasn't <laughs> to do. Ah. sure looks like it's going to crash right so you're going i don't think i want to do turkish airlines no fault of turkish airlines but it's a problem with the media placement and then you've got really stupid stuff where just the local, local people come along and go, oh, I'm not going to give them 20% off. And so they take the two off, they leave the zero. Now you've got 0% off. This That's actually kind of funny. That's a, that could potentially be a good marketing strategy if you have good quality food. Yeah. It, it, it might, if in, if in fact that's what you're going to sell them at, you know. So, um, but, and then the comment up above is, well, who advertises that you'll be paying full price? You know, uh, this is <laughs> Consumer Reports uh, always does five or six of these at the, the very last part of their magazine each month. And these are a couple more that Consumer Reports have done. First one is, <laughs> here you go. This is a good spot for your wheelchair, right? uh, meaning probably way over to the left. Don't take the stairs is what they meant. And then this one over here says, um, whichever floor you're on, you'll find our service on another level. Sort of like, we won't be where, wherever you need us, we're not going to be there. We'll be on a different floor. <laughs> you know, it's pretty clever. It's pretty clever, though, but it's, it's I know what we meant. They meant to say, but the actual meaning is hilarious. Yeah. Now, they might, they, they, maybe they actually meant that, but I, I'm not so sure that they did. But and then uh, here you've got placement problems. So iPad Air pays for this, you know, big, big ad in the New York Times. I mean, this is expensive. And what does the New York Times do? They put Malaysia says jet went down in the ocean uh, right underneath it. And of course, here's the ocean with iPad. Now, you might say, oh, well, that's, there's not a real association there. But we don't know what's going on subliminally. You know, you go down in the ocean, but you see this undersea shot. What, what does that mean to some people? There are a lot of people that have water phobias, you know. And then you've got, uh, oops, uh, sorry, one of them's repeated. This one here is we wouldn't use these wipes to stay healthy, meaning um, premium, these are supposedly premium, there's no P, infecting wipes. So you see what happened is that was supposed <laughs> to be a P, and it's supposed to be disinfecting. And so, but you know, these, these premium magic hair Infecting wipes are just a lot more expensive than the, than the disinfectant one, you know. The, the premium infecting wipes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, pretty funny. Pretty funny. Okay, um, something wrong with my... And then we'll just f finish off with this last than 24-hour fitness, which is open Monday, Monday through Sunday. Huh. You know, it's like, oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> So that, oh, whoa, I had one more there. Let me see if I can actually bring this back up, reshare this. Are you, did it come back up or did I? I... Yeah, let's see. 
So in this this particular one, uh, it's not quite as dramatic as I had hoped. This particular this is Gal Gadot, who's one of the really hot celebrities nowadays. Um, and this is, of course, is Revlon. You know and understand Revlon. They're trying to make people, you know, women beautiful. Um, this is basically saying I can do it, and therefore I'm I'm going to do it. Sort of like you know I can do it if I want to. But then on the other hand, take a look at this as contrast. What do you think of that? This is Revlon too. Only this one is doesn't take away the pain, but it conceals what happened. What does that mean? Am I supposed to gladly cover up the the stitches that my husband gave me last night? And like, oh, this is great. This stuff is so great. It covers up the fact that I was beaten last night. Um, pretty strange stuff. I don't think that they did themselves uh, much, uh, much service on this particular one. If anything, while it might have been shocking, and there have been uh, brands that have done a good job using a shock method before, but um, for the most part, uh, I don't know, it, it just doesn't feel right to me. It doesn't seem as though it, it would be accepted by an awful lot of the women who, who, who would be good buyers. Okay, so um, let's see. I wanted to have a view of all of us here just so that we could chat. And I think it obviously didn't work. Oh, but now it is working. Hey, we're all here. Wow. Great. I thought I would just give this a try, <clears throat> kind of the, the panel the panel look. Um, oh, man, <clears throat> trying to pull myself far away. So it looks like I'm sitting in that floating in there. <laughs> well, John, John, John was sitting down in, in a low chair, and he looked like a little boy initially. So he went out and got a phone book so he could sit up a little higher. Yeah. So I, <laughs> so I, I thought it would be fun because <clears throat> when we do the, when this when when Zoom records, usually it only shows who's talking. I'd like to get rid of that feature so it shows everybody on the screen. But anyway, I thought I would just throw it up. We've got you know a few more minutes to discuss. I went a little bit shorter because we're going to break it into three or four different pieces. But I thought I thought you know uh, we we might have discussion just about perceptions, things that go right, things that go wrong in advertising when we're trying to determine what it is that we're going to say to people, and we'll we'll get in that into that just a, a little bit more starting starting next time. Any comments or general discussions, questions? Uh, I did join a little late on on the beginning to last five minutes. Apologize for that, but I think I could catch on. <clears throat> on the conversation based on that. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Being a designer, I think you I think you uh you you've been through and done an awful lot of this stuff. So I, I focus a little bit more on the language that is used more than the visuals. Yeah. Um, and that's probably because of my my background. I grew up in an English speaking country prior to coming to America. Um, that I believe speaks American. As opposed um, to American, right? Yeah, I, uh, I, I do joust. But seriously, I found early on in my, um, my walk that I could not identify the age of somebody on a telephone very easily when I first moved to America, mm. which I could do extremely well in New Zealand. Oh. And I was a little perplexed as to why that was. I was in my 20s at the time. And then I realized it's the lexicon and the the combinations of words that we use, even though they're the same, they're different. And then I discovered that um, we have racial and ethnic and cultural differences that are reflected in our language and in America ever so much. I mean, I landed in the Midwest and we had a lot of business with the uh, East Coast. Um, and also with the Midwest separately and with the West Coast. And, you know, back in the day, those language sets were different. So I think one of the problems we've got is what demographic are we actually trying to reach out to? And do we want to be contemporary or do we want to be, as the British say, just right on all the time? Yeah, well, and that's right. And of course, that's that's why 
by going through the process of doing doing a customer profile, understand the demographics, the cohort group that they're in, age group, et cetera. That's why it's so important. And and in that example, that would include um, you know New York City folks who I don't want to lump them all together because there are a million different kinds of those. But when you think about the East Coast um, sort of vernacular, um, uh, the different accents, uh, some of the some of the different um, intent levels of intensity, um, and in some of the jargon, it is it 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 it's not as bad today as it was 10, 20, 30 years ago. And I did a lot of work with um, uh, in the in the rag industry, uh, um, a lot of work on the East Coast. I, I was from Midwest, from Denver, and so you know here here I am, sort of this Middle America kind of a guy with with this you know kind of a more polite persona, kind of an aw shucks kind of a culture. And then here I'm I'm buying stuff from these guys that are pushy. And they expect you to be able to deal with that. And um, in some ways, they would try to take advantage, I think, because they were more aggressive than, say, I was used to. It took me several years to understand that culture. I finally came to really um, understand it, enjoy it, and, uh, and I think uh, adjust to it. But you're absolutely right. I mean, things, you know, there's the industry language, but then there's also the the street language of the people you're dealing with and when they're they're dealing with buyers who are selling on fifth you know fifth avenue or maybe they're selling just a little bit north up in up in um uh, a tougher neighborhood in the upper west east side west side or out on long island um you know or um you know i mean it's it's a totally different totally different business even within say manhattan itself um uh, harlem for instance i had a client in harlem where i was going in to sit down with the store owners and they accompanied me with two cars into the neighborhood and the timing was just perfect so that they could open the steel gates as i opened the door of the car with a guy on each side walked in so um that's a <laughs> that's yeah. a different that's a different kind and they do business there all day long i mean but you see that you know it's it's only 15 20 blocks away from fifth avenue but it's a totally different culture so that's what we're really talking about is that how do you meet that um expectation uh, and now we become more homogenized but i think lately and, and you were kind of starting to go down that direction but with all of with all of the social discontent that there is now in all of the the woke stuff going on this makes it even harder than it ever was to communicate especially mass communicate yeah well it's hard to say something that is um politically correct on all avenues at, at some point you you kind of realize you've got to offend some group somewhere with the choice of language that you've got so you know well i would i would agree with that statement if we kind of go back to the 70s and 80s when we were still doing mass communication uh but niche communication is what allows you to get away from that and Correct. so knowing your niche and knowing the small small subgroups and then communicating with them in that way does help a lot so then the other one that goes on, which is one that is, um, it, I would say it's more generic and it goes across cultural, ethnic um, diversity areas, is your behavioral preference to the speed of which you'd like to communicate. Like for me, I'd like to speak very fast and get on with it. And I'm going to change subjects, have multiple subjects going on, use my hands. This is my natural way of communicating. However, I find that that doesn't work so well when we're trying to communicate an idea to more than my select group of friends. Right, right. Well, and in, in, in your particular business, I mean, you're, you're dealing with small business people uh, looking for an office in a specific situation, and um, they may or may not understand the concept. And if you go too fast, 
they may miss pieces and they may be alienated. So well, if I may, if I could pick on uh, Mr. Ed for just one moment, and I mean this in all sincerity, Ed has a language of communication that I think surpasses uh, most others. And that is, regardless of the language that you chose and the way you present, your speed of presenting, at some point, if we're in business and you start presenting your topic of choice, then it's going to come down to a clear efficiency of numbers. And at some point, no matter how you say it and what kind of voice you say it, I'm just drawn to the numbers. Is that correct? I mean, do you I have a certain a good observation. Yeah, I think that's a large part of my uh, presentation. That's true. I focus on the numbers. Yeah. And you, you can't argue with the numbers and the, the numbers don't really have a, a political, religious, ethnic, emotional character to them. They're just what they are. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's, uh, I, I guess a lot of financial folks are trained that way. Well, I think, I think also that if you, you kind of dig a little bit deeper into the um, financial folks slash detail oriented um, kind of folks, um, they have a certain kind of a personality that even lends to that. They don't, they don't really, you know, they, they're more interested in the facts. They're more interested in the details. More interested in the details. Yeah. Well, yeah, it, it has trump cards. Yeah. And the trump cards that come out is at the end of the day, here's what the retained earnings, here's what the profit is, here's what the you know five year cost is. I mean, that they're, they're trump cards. You can't argue mm -hmm. with those. All yeah. the nice ideas in the world get lined up at some point along a spectrum that is called profit and loss. Yeah. Yeah. Because he does occasionally have to use language to draw emphasis on really critical things that maybe uh, maybe the, the the client has not um, completely comprehended in terms of. Well, that's you know, a very saying, good point, Ron. You know, it's very true. And and you do that. You know, yes, you, I, that's you, very you true. bring that forward, but it's it's never you know he's never pounding on the table and doing a Khrushchev or something like that. And saying, <laughs> I really want you to listen to me. I think it's well. That's why I like presenting with Ron, um, various clients that we have, and it's because of our balance. And when you add the two approaches together, I think the client gets a better perspective of what's going on. So you could actually wrap this conversation back into the way we started, and that is at some point we have emotional uh, the, the conveying of emotional messages. Uh, and the conveying of what ifs futures and maybe it is best to have something that can uh, this may be an interesting dialogue how do we actually achieve both how do we have a duality of message transference is that possible and is that is that what the really skilled marketeers do or do they stick to one course i i, I think so it's difficult to do um Generally speaking, you're talking about business to business being kind of down to earth, factually driven, et cetera. And you, you know, the 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 emotion is 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 way low by comparison to what you do tend to do with consumers. Um, you're not really trying to sell based on emotion because they're resisting it. They're, and they're actually you could actually get yourself into a hole if you go too far down that road because they're going, who is this guy? What am I doing? Why why are they why have they tried to sell me emotionally uh, on this style sheet when all I need is the facts and I'll make up my own mind? You know, I mean, very, very many times that's the, the buyer's attitude. You know, they're going to make the choice. That's why they love being a buyer, um, which is quite different than, than the consumer, which is just like there, there's a certain amount of logic built into this, but it's such an emotionally driven decision you know buying a car as much as we think that we're doing our best job to get the best price um ultimately if you just are in love with the car um and you have to have the car you're going to buy the car unless you can find exactly that same car for a lot less money someplace else um the why that's because most of us make car buying decisions on on some level of emotion I, I have always tried not to do that. And, um, and um, 
and so hard on the salesperson that it is it's embarrassing because you know I, I just go in and say look here's the deal and here's the money so say yes or say no so you know they don't really like that why because they're not equipped to deal with it at that level they know they can only go so much on the price they also know that if they if they go to that price they're leaving most of their commission on the table because there is a floor uh, for what the dealer will take and then there's the price that the car salesman will take because that's where his compensation comes from to to a partial degree um but when we take a look at something like you know revlon and those kinds of things oh my gosh we're talking emotion the whole way you know um they're they're really trying to appeal to something down really deep uh and and so you know that's that's a business where if you are if if you have appealed to someone so let's just say that that one image of the lady with the stitches in her nose if that really resonates with somebody who happens to be in that situation and she's looking for something that covers up so well that she's going to be beautiful when she goes uh to the ball tonight or out to dinner or whatever and revlon can actually do what it says um th those emotions will drive her to buy that at any price so there there is an advantage to overcome price barriers by using the emotional side of the cell and that's that it most often happens in consumer b2c b2b you can do that and i've i've found that to be possible in some cases but it's a little different it's not like uh, the buyer who's buying a motor rewind or a crane or uh, some industrial equipment. It's not like they're going to have some invo emotional investment in there. But you can go to things like safety, security, reliability. Um, they can feel better about the, the job that they're doing because they're buying something that they, they know the company would find useful. It'll have a good payback period. It won't have a lot of, you know, warranty work, etc. So, you know, there there used to be a saying um, that um, maybe it was General Electric. No, it was IBM a long time ago. You probably remember this, John. It used to be a saying that you never get fired if you buy IBM. That's because IBM was the leader. They knew what they were doing. They were the best at it. And if you wanted to be safe in your job, now here's an emotional issue. If you want to be safe in your job, you bought IBM. So if you have kind of the same solution for two or three companies, roughly the same price, maybe a little premium for IBM, good chance you'll pick IBM simply because you won't lose your job over it. So yeah, there are those times when it can be used. And I think it it is better if you can combine them it's just um, a little, you know, it skewed less emotion to the B2B and more emotion to the, the B2C. Uh, we can't hear you, Edgar. Sorry for joining the party a little late. Can you hear me now? Yeah. <clears throat> so I, I don't know if it's a comment or a question or a combination of both uh, for you, Ron, but uh, the, the image with the, the makeup, right um with the lady that was uh, hit, uh, battered obviously assuming that maybe her husband hit her right yeah so battered. Assume. now the uh what, what, what i was thinking personally asking or wondering is well that's not the target audience i don't think a lot of women are going through that mm -hmm. but it's the virtu virtual signaling to those that that are not going through that what they're probably trying to sell is potentially is like, hey we're a really good company we're bringing awareness to this I'm not sure what they're really doing uh to help the scenarios of women in situations like that but i think it's the virtual signaling alone that they're probably marketing for for those people that say hey they're a good company buy from them. i don't know mm -hmm. um, yeah no i, I but that's why they pull something off like that um sorry you cut out the last sentence but um well I, th I think that's a really good observation and i think you're right and that that sort of ties in a little bit with some of the kind of mark marketing going on today because there is a group of people um out there who will respond to the whole virtual virtue signaling kind of message uh and there are there are those who have done that I mean, take a look at disney 
the virtue signaling that they have done recently in the, say the last year has been pretty profound. Um, and it's and it's also had a huge backlash. It's it's so the, the backlash has been so am amazing that they're they're losing subscribers. People are not willing to pay the price anymore to go to Disneyland. And uh, Governor DeSantis is trying his best to take away all the rights to govern their own land in Florida. This has not been a very successful campaign for them. So it's, you know, I think it's, it's good to bring it up and mention, and I think there are times when it makes sense. If you've got like a, a niche brand, uh, you can have a little bit better shot at getting it right. But when you are a large company, sort of in the, the mass media like Disneyland is, you better be careful because they've alienated way more people than they've attracted. So it's a risky, risky situation. Yeah. Um, back in the day, again, going back to my growing up in New Zealand, I don't know whether it was just that I was growing up in New Zealand or not, but we were told that, uh, you know, when we had dinner with friends, you just don't talk about sex. You don't talk about politics and you don't talk about religion. Now, it almost seems like that if we could, and of course, what did I want to talk about? I wanted to talk about sex, politics, and religion. <laughs> it's a, just a, that's a certain cohort group, John. That's a certain cohort group. Yeah. I, know, I understand that. So <laughs> forgive me for that. But um, isn't that kind of where we're at a little bit? Is that some of the political agendas have got to be talking about sex, religion, uh, and politics a little too hotly? And we know in business environment, we can't do that. I have clients who have a wide spectrum of beliefs in all of those areas. And, yes. you know, frankly, um, provided they behave like normal human beings and respect one another, uh, that's business. And actually, I'm going to go back to Ed's rule of thumb. At the end of the day, it comes down, do they pay their bills on time? Are they respectful with not bouncing checks? Um, and do they treat the business environment in a professional way? In which case, they're a good client. Mm -hmm. uh, that's um, that's right. That is right. One of uh, one of our friends who happened to be a kind of an, a lifetime New Yorker, uh, <clears throat> when when the it, the issue of Trump came up, wondering how she might change her decisions, she said, "When the plumber comes over to unclog the toilet, I don't give a damn who he voted for." And so, you know, the point there is, look, the plumbers hired just to take care of the toilet. That's their job. If they get it done, I'll call them back next time. So it's like, forget it. I don't care. Well, there are there are people <clears throat> clearly who are making decisions based on somebody's political vote. All that can do is diminish your audience. And so if you have a targeted audience that might um, well say like the Browns and the Greens, who generally do have a targeted audience. They, they are a target with the exception of this one sort of characteristics. Well, are you going to alienate one or the other? And which one are you going to alienate? It's like, well, let's let's not go too far either way. Um, let's let's, you know, we want to deliver milk. This isn't a political statement. This isn't even quite about an environmental statement. We offer a group of environmental attributes to the product. We offer really, really, really high quality to the product. The price is reasonable. You make the decision whether you want to do it or not to do it. But we're not going to virtue signal by picking an individual group and saying, um, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're going to support that particular uh, I, idea. So I, I think that it's it's I think Edgar you you really picked it right I think and there's an awful lot of that going on, but I have recommended to um, my uh, clients in almost every case uh, let's not get too far afield and let's keep it let's keep it polite like like you said John. <laughs> Okay, good. Well, thank you. Um, we're coming coming up to the hour, and I think we are about ready to wrap it up. Appreciate you all being here. Um, next time, we're going to move into 
actually showing sort of demonstration of how you go through the process, how you how you really keep it into you know focus on the target, and then try and develop a message that really has has some pertinence to a particular target. Uh, and we'll just get a little bit deeper. So thank you very much. Great to see all of you, and uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks, guys. Thank Thanks. you, gentlemen. Take care now. Bye bye. Have a wonderful day.